very much for pronouncing my name there in the, with a typical French accent. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here, very pleased to be in this uh, special city, uh, very pleased to be uh, with you, very pleased to see so many young women. Uh, and this is, I think, quite new in the Italian circles. I mean, I've been sort of, uh, you know, um, moving within these circles uh, for the last 25, 30 years. And uh, generally, they were only young men. And uh, now I see that there is an equal representation between men and women, uh, which is very encouraging. I, I was saying that I moved in these sort of uh, liberal circles for quite a long time. And for a long time, of course, what put us together, what reunited us, was that we had a common enemy. It was out there, completely to the east of this map, doesn't figure on this map. Of course, it was the USSR. And the fight that we were uh, sort of um, battle that we were fighting um, was in the name of democracy. And after the demise of the Soviet Union, people said, we won. That's it. The battle is over. And now, 25 years later, 30 years later, we say, well, actually, what is it that we have won? Throughout the 20th century, since Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States in 1916 and 1917, um, went to Congress in order to bring the United States into war, he made that famous declaration, we want to make the world safe for democracy. And, of course, the war against fascism and so on, was uh, driven with the same intention, fight for democracy. You remember what Churchill said, you know, when he was asked, what about democracy? He said, it is the worst regime, with the exception of all others. Now, I'll be a bit provocative here, because I want to make you think, I would like to have some response from you. I want to say that democracy is the worst regime with no exception. And when you say this, you know that you are immediately a sort of you know, pariah. You are kind of outcast. People who say this are no longer invited to forum. They never appear on television. They don't publish in the right sort of journals or in the right sort of media. And if they are a state, a non-democratic state, then of course, that's an outlaw amongst nations. And I think it is because we have a misconception of democracy. Because there are two understandings of democracy, and we confuse them. One understanding, one definition of democracy, is simply a way to appoint the people who are going to rule over you. That's what democracy originally was about. In that sense, democracy is opposed to hereditary monarchy, or aristocracy. The people who rule, rule because they are the sons, generally the sons, of somebody. There is a continuity, there is a lineage. <coughs> um, or it's opposed to a dictatorship, you know, somebody took power, military junta. And uh, it is also another system that existed in, in uh, Greece, um, opposed to people who are simply drawn by lots. You know, you select, there is lottery, and these people are going to do. All these things are against democracy. Democracy is about people electing their rulers. There is another understanding of democracy, which says it's everything that is cool, everything that is nice, you know, we say, oh, um, teachers that um, will allow you to pass exams and so on, they are democratic. Uh, the Catholic Church is not democratic. Multinationals are not democratic. Um, there is that sort of distinction between what is nice, democratic, and what is harsh, what is painful, what is violent, anti-democratic. Um, so, of course, if you go for the second definition, then everyone wants that. We want a gentle society. 
So we want to be on the democratic side. But let's look at what are the problems with that definition. Let's look at why it is that having fought for democracy, having won, when now you know, all these countries here in Europe are democracies, why do we find someone like Putin? Why do we find that we don't have the life that my generation aspired to? My generation in the 70s, when we said we are fighting for democracy because we want a larger life. We don't want the repetition of the same. We don't want the border. We are bigger than you know, that sort of little littleness of life. We want something that is exciting. And we have democracy, and we don't have that excitement. We are here because we understand that there is something more that democracy has not brought us. So why is it? Well, if we go back to where we were in the 19th century, we see that democracy arrived in the world at the same time as industrialization. And, you know, correlation is not causation, of course. But think about this. What an industrial process says is that we can make a lot of goods provided they are all the same. We can manufacture resemblance, and that is cheap. This can be made millions and millions and millions of times, exactly the same one. Now, when people say we need a way to govern, and it, we no longer want, you know, that was the enlightenment, we no longer want people to govern simply because they are the son of someone. We no longer want people to govern because they say that they are anointed by God, that they are ruling in the name of the Bible, the Quran, or whatever. We want people who are anointed because the people are sovereign. In other words, it is us that will decide who is ruling over us. The people are sovereign. The general will of the people will be expressed in the rulers. But how do you quantify the general will? How do I know what you all want? <coughs> so, going by the process of industrialization, well, what we will do is that we will set very simple rules, majority. We will set a very simple product that everyone can follow everyone can produce. So if there is a referendum, it will be a yes or a no. Manufacturing, yes or no. Manufacturing a list in an election. And a candidate will come and will give you a program. It's a bit like, you know, the typical sort of metaphor is to say you have a caddy full of goods that are from a supermarket. And the other guy has another cat. And the other lady there, she has another cat. And you get to choose one of these cats. Simple. The problem is that in the candy, there are things that you want, but there are things that you don't want. But that's what you do when you vote for a list of, you know, a program of a political party. There are things in the political party program that you like, and others that you don't like. But you have to get everything. You cannot pick and choose. So the rulers will tell you what it is that you are going to get once you have elected them. So every vote <coughs> counts, but a bit like square meters. You add the square meters, but some of the square meters represent triangles, others circles, others squares, and in the end, people say, well, that's the will of the people. Some people are better informed. Some people know absolutely nothing of what they are voting for. Some people have an interest in voting for this, this or that candidate, or for yes or no. Other people don't care. Other people should not care. For instance, if there is a referendum, I lived a long time in Switzerland, and you know, in Switzerland, there are always referendums. 
And for a referendum, for instance, on school reforms, my children are grown up. Why do I vote on school reforms? I don't have any children. And if I vote, my vote doesn't count more than, for instance, a mother who has three kids at school and for whom you know, uh, school reform is really important. But, of course, that was the idea. And that was the idea that came in Athens, you know, the early democracy. Because in Athens, the only people who voted were male, citizens, and probably no, long, no more than you know, a few thousand. When Rousseau, the modern thinker of democracy in Switzerland, you know, what he had in mind was a very, was a very small community, the minded you know, people who would come to the sort of big sort of square, town square, and <clears throat> they would vote. But of course they were all peasants, they were all farmers, they, were, they had the same life. They lived in that little valley, and their problems were all the same. But we are, today, in large countries, millions and millions of people, with different backgrounds, different jobs, different views of life, different religion. So how do you put all this into a general will? That is, I think, the big problem. In other words, democracy doesn't have an anthropology. It doesn't treat us as individuals with our aspirations, with our dreams, with our interests. But it's <coughs> a situation where, at the moment of casting our vote, we are treated like witches, exactly the same, coming out from the same factory. <coughs> now, the other problem, of course, with democracy, is that it is not a way of limiting power. <coughs> It is a way of saying who will exercise power. That is the true definition of democracy. And then whoever exercises power has unlimited power. There is nothing in the ideology of democracy that prevents the majority from introducing torture in order to get confession from society from confiscating property of any minority, especially the rich, that's a minority that the government is confiscating property from, uh, of imposing a language, a religion, on a minority community. There is nothing in democracy that prevents the majority from doing this, which, of course, is absurd. It is absurd. And that's why you never have pure democracy. What you have is always democracy with a qualification. For instance, people's democracy, where the majority can do anything except going against the teachings of Marx, Lenin, socialism, whatever. Islamic democracy, where the majority can do anything except going against the teachings of Quran, the Hadith, and so on. Or liberal democracy, where the majority can do anything except going against certain human rights. But then, what is important is not democracy, it is the objective. What matters is not that the people can <coughs> exercise power through its delegate. What matters is how much power the delegates may exercise. And if they have little power, if they have restricted power, then who cares who is not elected? So you see that this confusion. We believe that the fight, we believe, my generation believed, that the fight was for democracy. Actually, we got pretty good. And Putin says, you know, I've been elected with a large majority. No one is contesting that I, even if I fiddle the elections and so on, no one is contesting <coughs> that I have a majority. But look, is this what we want? 
I think that the confusion was we fought for democracy. We needed to fight for liberalism. What matters is libertarian ideas. What matters is the implementation of these ideas, and not who is in power. So <clears throat> democracy is not a new way of living together. It's not creating a new society without power, or with very limited power. It's not creating a sort of gentle society, where people would live by free interaction. People would be free to embrace the sort of lifestyle they want. Gay, um, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, religious fundamentalists, speaking that language, uh, teaching your kids in another language, doing the things you want, being creative. Creating, <coughs> creating the new. Creating the new in peace. That is not what democracy brings you. This is what libertarianism does. And do not confuse them. There is a problem, I think, in democracy. <coughs> is that it teaches you to love power. <coughs> when the reason I didn't vote, I said, well, I'm not a Democrat. I'll tell you why I don't like voting. Because the moment I put my vote in the ballot box, what I'm really saying is this is how I want you to live. By putting my ballot for a program, a political program, I'm telling you all who prefer another political program, get lost. If I have a majority, I will impose this program on you. Kids, when they are taught, taught at school democracy, they learn that one day, when they have a right to vote at 16, 18, 19, they too will be able to vote and tell their little sort of friends on the playground, we have a majority and you, the minority, are going to obey. Is this that we want to teach kids? Is this the sort of society that we want to live in? Of course, what people say is, but you know, one day the majority will change. And you will have a right. You will have, you, know, you will be the majority. And you will boss. So what sort of society is this? You know, if I cannot impose something on you, I just wait and then I impose it on you. It's, you know, if you don't, <coughs> You do it to me, one day I'll do it to you. No. Let's go our separate ways. Let's live the lifestyle that we want. And not say, you know, one day I'll rule over you and so on and take my revenge, but now you rule over me. That's not what we want. So a democratic society has not changed what power is about. Just shame the people who hold power. In other words, a democratic society is still a society of slaves who are looking for masters. Whereas a libertarian society is a society of masters who have no need for slaves.